everybody and welcome to another exciting edition of Words, Images, and Worlds. Glad on this episode to be talking with author and educator Tom Hart. Tom, thank you for jumping in and thank you for joining even though you're feeling a little under the weather. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, yeah, it's a pleasure. And I, I think I'm mostly fine. But if I um, uh, if there are excessive silences, it's probably my, my brain fog coming in. But I think I think the fog will clear. After yeah, a few yeah. Of I have I have been there certainly <laughs> absolutely um, so you are a person who I primarily know through your book uh, I think it's called the art of graphic memoir um, mm -hmm. and so excited to talk about comics excited to talk about the graphic memoir what was it about the comics medium that drew you in as a, an author researcher and creator um well, my most of my memories are with comics. Um, my earliest memories are um, uh, tracing and then later copying Charlie Brown out of uh, newspaper comic strips. Charlie Brown and then all the other characters from Peanuts. Um, so you could you could say I was always drawn to them, but maybe maybe as an adult, I was able to reflect on it a little bit more. And I realized that what I think I was drawn to was the, the way that emotion was contained in little boxes. Mm -hmm. um, and there's an, a lot, there was a lot of emotion in early Peanuts comics, actually in all the Peanuts comics. Um, it later got sold. Even, even when it was coming out, it got sold as like just the happiness is a warm puppy. And um I forget what bread they sold, but you know, they sold bread and corn flakes and whatever and life insurance and stuff. But, but the comics themselves were full of anger and fighting and wailing and weeping and wailing. I mean, and, and uh, malaise and frustration and, and excitement and ecstasy. And so seeing all those things uh, captured in little contained boxes, they helped me sort of uh, work my way through the emotional world as a child and as a preteen and then teen. Um, yeah, so I, I hardly remember anything else, but <laughs> but uh, responding to comics and drawing comics. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just describing that in Peanuts, I'm thinking about all of those images of the characters sort of laying on the the floor of the panel, beating their fists, or um, you know the the moments of crying and and things like that. So uh, love yeah, that idea lot. of uh, lots of depth there, lots of depth. Yeah, yeah. No, it was a very yeah, it was a very deep comic strip. It was it's really a profound, great thing, um, and and really funny and. Uh, yeah, just a lot of emotion. And some of the side characters that you don't think about much actually had really great depth, like Sally. It's a really great character and lots of frustrations about school um, and and other things. And anyway, yeah, it's great. Yeah. Uh, it's still, it's still my model for how to make comics. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I believe there was a book about Peanuts that just won an Eisner, if I'm not mistaken. Uh I think oh, if that's there's the a, case. Yeah, if there's another one, I, I don't know about it. There was the Schultz biography that came out, but I think that was almost 10 years now, and it certainly was up for an Eisner. Yeah, it's possible there's another one. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. cool. I believe so. Cool. Um, yeah. So with that depth of comics in mind, I'm I'm Googling the Eisner Awards currently. Just oh, to, okay. To You'll see my friend in. Jess Rellison in there, too. She got nominated, although I think the awards just got handed out, right? She must not have won. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just a few weeks back. Um, curious about what you would say to someone who is skeptical about comics, their viability, and you had a prepared a response. And then huh. I mentioned uh, the role of educators. So curious to hear how how you might go after that. <laughs> well, the the truth is, is I um, uh, I run a comics school. It's largely online, but it's also in person. And um, and I got my hands full with comics converts and comics enthusiasts. And I don't even think about the skeptics at all, <laughs> at all. Um, 
And uh, I really, yeah, I really have my hands full nurturing those people who have had their eyes open to comics, whether recently or for a long time, who are trying to work their way through it, who have um, have found that they love the medium, but are stumbling in making things really, really happen for them, um, who are frustrated with the, the creative process, which has a lot of ups and downs. And like when the downs come, they're like, and they're ready to give up. So I hope we try and help those people out quite a bit, but we also help people who need, uh, who need, who, who want the tools to be really more articulate in the medium and who want to, the tools to explore their own meaning more in the, in the medium. Um, so yeah, so my hands are really full with with that, but um, but there are some good there, there's some good things to think about when it comes to skepticism about comics, and and I'll actually use myself as an example because honestly, I was pretty even though I've basically done nothing but comics all my life, I was pretty hit. Oh, excuse me, I was pretty skeptical of it as a as a um, medium that could be as great as our um, maybe prose, maybe novels or uh, text. Um, and, um, you know, it was a high brow, low brow kind of thing. And I've always had been happily very low brow, but, uh, but I also sort of put, um, real writing on on um, on a pedestal, intellectually, you know. I thought real writing is harder, and that's why I can't do it, <laughs> or why I don't do it. And uh, comics is is um, a little sillier, and that's why I do it, right? But I'm not sure if that's necessarily true. The Words and prose have a long history now um, because uh, because of technology. And um, the main technology is the printing press. And the printing press made it cheaper to spread words than anything else for a very, very, very long time. And, um, and as as images, images were pretty difficult to, to duplicate for ages, for hundreds of years, and only got slightly easier, you know, in the 1800s. They actually, from the 1800s on, they got slightly easier to reproduce. And now they're virtually, um, it's like water. <laughs> we're mm -hmm. swimming in images that are being reproduced constantly. And, um, and so I think I used to, you know, so so the prejudice I had for words was um, was one really based on on just uh, an accident of history, I think. And I'm not sure that that words and pictures in combination isn't necessarily a um, a more vibrant or maybe even possibly a more human medium. It might be. I'm not sure. I'm sort of in an exploration phase now. Now that I um now that I've allowed myself to believe in the medium a little bit more. Um, I don't know what our earliest forms of communication were, but they were probably, it was probably oral storytelling. It was probably music. Mm -hmm. um, with oral storytelling comes a lot of behavior and a lot of movement, which tends to look like pictures. Drawing, I think, has, has probably been something people have done for a very long time as well. Um, clearly longer than writing but not uh but there's a lot of similarities there anyway it, it's much more complicated than i originally thought is sort of my point and um and so yeah it's just this great like this is wide open field of understanding available to us if we want to start thinking about words and pictures together and story there that's my <laughs> i like it i like it but i like the you mentioned being an exploration because um I mean, I, as an English teacher, of course, I value um, character-based prose, yeah. you know, reading left to right, all of those sort of things. At the same time, I value 
um, embodied stories. I was talking with someone yesterday mm-hmm. about the storytelling of acting. Yeah. Um, I, I value film as a way of capturing that. I value oral storytelling because we wouldn't have things like the Odyssey without that. Uh, and then I value the the artistic image based sort of ways that people create stories. So I, I'm I feel like there's so much baby in the bathwater that happens and people as an educator, if I say comics, people sort of think, oh, do you mean everything needs to be comics? Um, but I, I love thinking about it as a means of telling stories. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's really magical. And, um, you know, we're taking pictures with our brain constantly, mm-hmm. take pictures with our gosh darn phones constantly, probably. Mm-hmm. And um and our existence is very complicated and um, we might as well explore this existence in, in, um, in, in a complex medium if, if we can. Um, and there are lots of them. Writing is still great, you know, <laughs> um, and all those other things are still great, but comics is pretty interesting. And, and um, I don't know, it's where, it's, it's, it's where my heart lies. Yeah. Yeah. So with that idea in mind of um, exploring stories in the medium, I'm going to mention the Art of Graphic Memoir again. Um, Mm -hmm. One of the works that I've cited quite often, I've cited your work probably at least 10 times at this point uh, Mm -hmm. as I've written about comics. Yeah, yeah. Um, So anything that you would want to share with listeners about the possibilities of sharing memoir in graphic novel or comics form, um, recognizing that they should also check out the book that you have that, that goes into some wonderful detail. Anything I'd, I I want to share about specifically about writing memoir or making graphic memoir? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I was really lucky when I was writing that book to contact um, contact uh, my friend Dylan Horrocks, um, I, who reminded me of a quote by Joe Chapetta, who was already going to be in that book. Um, and Joe Chapetta's memoir, which is lost to history basically now, I don't think anybody knows about it. So that's one reason I put it in the book. It's called Silly Daddy, and it's a memoir he kept um, while becoming a very young father. Mm-hmm. And then um, I think he eventually, I think he pretty early on splits up with his wife, but he's the main caretaker, and and it's just lots of stories about that. But it's also extremely fantastical. Like he makes up stuff that these like adventures that they go on constantly, and he's also daydreaming all these relationships and all these plausible you know possible uh possible realities and um and uh in talking about comics i think it applies to memoir and comics both he says um this is not the bomb squad take unnecessary risks Mm -hmm. um which i love like that's the yeah i i I, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I just love the idea, you know, you know, take risks, play. Um, and a lot of, a lot of people, truth be told, a lot of people writing memoir are, um, are exploring quite a bit of suffering. And so I don't want to discount that by saying be playful with it. Um, but it's probably more important that you um, find ways to get it on paper than it is to make it perfect. Mm-hmm. or or to make it like other things you've seen and so um getting getting caught up in in the right way to do things will almost certainly stall you and almost certainly make you feel that worse and so if you can get yourself into that mindset where um where you realize it matters more to get it on the paper and it also then it later depending on who you are it might matter more to have someone read it as well um some people can just put things on the paper and be good with it. And some people need at least a reader or two. And that's most people. Um, but that matters way more than, than doing it the right way. It matters way more than doing it the way you think it needs to be done. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would, I would say that's, that's the main piece of advice is, um, is get it out there. The other, the other um, bit of advice I would say is find a, find a community yeah. who, of other people who are doing something similar um, and be, 
be part of that community, be part of the give and take, and everybody can support each other. And then you'll find that it's actually, um, the effort becomes uh, spread out and it's actually less less difficult if you all help each other. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, so the final question would be um, resources, which again, I'll mention your book, but um, I know you also have a website where people can go and find out information. So any resources that you would want to share with listeners that want to learn more about your work or uh, graphic memoir. And I'll mention Charles M. Schultz, The Art and Life of the Peanuts Creator in 100 Objects by Benjamin Clark and Nat Gertler. That's the the one that won Best Comics Related Book this year. But the 100 Eisner. Objects? I don't know that book. All right, hang on. I'll look at that one 100 Objects. Huh. <laughs> I've been a little out of it as far as new books go. Um, yeah, well, uh, my God, we have so many resources at our school. Our school is called the Sequential Artists Workshop, SAW for short, SAW Comics. Uh, you can find us at learn.sawcomics.org. We have, I, I've lost count of how many entry points we have at this point, but we have like so many free options, free courses free resources of, of a free community of thousands of people and then lots of places to go a little bit deeper if you want to um, either join a membership or take one of our courses uh, one of our live courses um, we also offer friday nights uh, at least eastern it's nighttime it's uh, seven o'clock eastern on fridays we have free workshops um uh, 7 p.m. to about 8.30 p.m. Pacific, that's 4 p.m. We have people from New Zealand coming and we're Saturday morning. Uh, so anyway, anyway, it's Friday Eastern time, 7 o'clock. But every Friday, uh, we have a new artist every week uh, giving about a 30-minute workshop. And then we do about, about 45 minutes of sharing and just showing what we did. And all of those are on YouTube, but it, but we do it live every single week anyway. So that's a great place to start, too. Um uh, I host, uh, I'm the MC of those, so I can also answer questions in the chat if people have questions about that. But we have tons and tons of resources on the SAW website. And again, that's uh, learn.sawcomics.org. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'll make sure to link that. Um, Thanks. Yeah, anything that I've missed that you want to make sure to mention before we close our talk? Well, shoot, why not? I should mention that I, just, <laughs> I, mean, I really covered a lot, but or and I appreciate it, Jason. But uh, we just published a new book. This is a friend of mine, Kelsey Irvick, and I, and any teachers out there who want to convince people to make comics. It is called The Field Guide to Graphic Literature. Hmm. And the subtitle is very long. And I never remember what it is. Artists and Writers on Creating Graphic Narratives, Poetry Comics, and Literary Collage. And it is an introduction to the, oops, it's not all text, but that looks at there. There we go. Mm -hmm. um, it is an introduction to dozens of different ways to make comics, including really some really out there ones towards the end, um, more collage. We have one that's all about erasure, which is basically marking up old books. Um, we have uh there's one our author who mostly talks about um uh dot dot to dot uh exercises oh, <laughs> and, wow. as a, and and the process of that as a form of comic making um but then we have a lot of uh and then we have a lot of really simple stuff it's deceptively simple like this woman who is writing about living on the farm is uh is actually really her essay and her exercise is really dedicated to geography and to place and landscape and and uh, so this book is uh twenty some art artists each offering a little essay I'll hold it up again each offering an essay and an excerpt and an exercise three E's um, for the classroom it just came out it's largely for college kids but i think i think high schoolers could get something out of it i mm -hmm. think there might be one or two naughty words um pretty sure oh, high school kids love those yeah yeah <laughs> but middle i don't know you know your middle school teachers might want to take a look mm -hmm. um there's some uh there's some really good actually there's some really good anti-racist stuff with keith knight 
who's a terrific cartoonist who um who had a show called woke for a while um uh there is a japanese woman whose main influence is uh is uh japanese scrolls so she oh, talks wow. about their similarities and so yeah it's a book we're really proud of and uh and uh, i was the i'm listed as the co-editor but i'm more the junior editor i i Kelsey did about 80% of the work at about 20. <laughs> Actually, the authors did about 80% of the work. And then after that, Kelsey did most of the rest. And then I did a little, but it's a good book. Love it. Love Designed it. for people that don't, that are new to comics or don't, don't understand it. And uh, maybe, maybe also designed for skeptics of comics. Not sure. Love it. Well, and I love the idea of merging poetry and comics and playing with different approaches so fantastic yeah. and I'm yeah there's lots about of that book cool yeah there's lots of that in there yeah definitely take a look yeah. yeah well tom thank you so much for joining me for a conversation i hope you uh fully feel better very very soon and uh glad to share about your work anytime and collaborate on things to come Thanks so much, Jason. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Have a good rest of the day. All right. Bye-bye.